Hey guys, I'm having nothing but technical difficulties trying to get this thing to work and I have no idea what's going on. So rather than be fancy, I'm just going to get the material out and we'll be fancy another time. Sound good? Okay, let's get this show on the road since we're running a little bit late. I am so sorry. Um, I need to like figure out what Facebook, what their deal is with Facebook. I have no idea. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about Old Testament narrative. Now you might be saying to yourself, why do I need to bother with the Old Testament? I am a New, uh, New Testament Christian, Jesus in the New Testament. Why do I even need to read the Old Testament? Well, it's important to read the Old Testament because if you're a Christian, the Old Testament is your spiritual history, right? Uh, that is something that we need to look at to see who came before us and to see what their stories were because it's really important to see what generations past have done. And so, um, you know, a lot of the Old Testament, a vast majority of the Old Testament is made up of narrative, right? And narrative is this story, you know, right, concept of a story. Um, and a lot of times people will still force incorrect interpretations and applications on narrative portions of the Bible as much as, or even maybe in some instances, more than they do other um parts of scripture. And so it's really important for us to understand narrative because it does make up really the bulk of the Old Testament. We need to have a really good grasp of what narrative is, what narrative does, what it doesn't do, what it isn't intended for, all that jazz. Narrative is just a fancy way of saying story. And so a lot of the Old Testament you'll hear when we say, oh, we know Bible stories and things like that. That's what we're talking about is Old Testament narrative. Uh, narratives are stories that are purposeful retelling uh, of the historical events of the past. And these are intended to give meaning and direction for people in the present. Uh, they tell um, a story that is not so much our story as it is God's story. And why it's important is, you've probably heard this um, saying, a guy named George Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. And that's what we need to take away from the Old Testament. These are stories that are intended to give meaning and direction to us because we need to know what the people who came before us did. New Testament talks about there are so great a cloud of witnesses. Well, how do we know who those great cloud of witnesses are unless we go back and learn their stories? So now that we've established kind of why narrative, let's talk a little bit about some of the details of narrative. Um, at its basic level, a narrative and the Bible narratives that we have, they tell us about things that happened in the past, right? Uh, there are three basic parts. You've got characters, you've got plot, and you've got plot resolution, okay? Just like what we have in movies and film today. We have characters, we have a plot, and then everybody has a, an ending and we go home, right? And we talk about, oh my goodness, Iron Man was amazing. Well, not Iron Man. The first one was okay. Second one was good. I didn't see the third one. Anyways, there are also three types of characters. You've got protagonists, you've got antagonists, and then you've got an agonist. And this is not someone who's always present in the story. Um, but what that means is the protagonist obviously is kind of your hero of the story. Your antagonist is the enemy. And the agonist is really the person that's causing the pain. And that's not always someone that's present in that story. So it's always important to, um, to understand that there are three characters and three types of people in there. Um, in a biblical story, the protagonist is actually God, right? So it's his story. He's the guy that, um, uh, he's the guy that this is all about. He's the main character in every single story. The antagonist is Satan, and that can be represented by opposing people uh, or groups or whatnot. Um, and then there's the agonists, and those are God's people, and they're the ones that are experiencing the pain, right? So it's a little bit different. It's, it's more along the lines of, say, one of the, uh, like a Guardians of the Galaxy type film, where you have people who are experiencing pain, but their story, it would be like if the first Guardians of the Galaxy, if we followed the people who were getting shot at by um, Loki, not Loki, who's the other guy? Anyways, you, I, hopefully you know what I mean. But, you know, the people who were on Terra, right? So they're the ones that are, if we were reading their stories, they would be the agonists, right? So they're experiencing the pain. But the story is really about 
bad guy in Guardians of the Galaxies, right? Make sense? Okay. Everything has a correlation. We're really, in every film that we see, we're really just retelling God's story. And if we have that as our understanding, we can go back in and it helps us, first off, understand scripture a little bit more, but it also helps us you know, enjoy some, some cool movies. I'm so sorry I keep doing this. We did some yard work yesterday and I think I got nibbled on by something who thought I was yummier than I, he should have. Critters, man, critters. Anyways, let's go back to biblical story. So in the biblical story, we have a basic plot. And here's the basic plot of the Bible, the whole Bible, all the narratives in that scripture. Here's the basic plot. One, we have a creator God, who has created a people for his name, in his own image, who were to be his stewards over the earth he created for their benefit. And that's really what we see in Genesis, the story of creation and the story of the Garden of Eden. That's the beginning of that narrative. Okay, and then in chapter three, we see where there's this enemy that enters into the picture who persuades the people who bear God's image uh, to bear his image instead and thus become God's enemies. And that's the fall. What we talk about is the fall. Okay. Then God rescues his people from the enemy's clutches, restores them back to his image, and will restore them in a new heaven and a new earth. And that portion of scripture, and that portion of the story rather, is basically, I don't know, Genesis chapter 4 to the end. So you really have the setup and the main, the main, uh, impetus for the story in the first couple of chapters and then the entire rest of scripture is how God goes about doing that and what that looks like. Uh, there are three levels of narrative in scripture. One is meta-narrative. For those of us that went through the story, um, meta-narrative is the, the the big story, right? The, the high story, the above story, which is um, the whole and universal plan of God worked out through his creation and focusing primarily on God's chosen people. So there's God's story and then there's our story, right? So he is making himself known to mankind through his story up here. And he is using the children of Israel in the Old Testament to really tell his story and to communicate himself to the world. He's just carved out a subset of the population and is having them uh, tell his story for him, essentially. Uh, the next level, so we've got meta narrative, which is the overall overarching story uh, of God as told through the children of Israel. And then the next is the story of God's redeeming a people for his name by means of the old and new covenants. What that means is he, he carves the people out and he tells the overall story, but then there is the more immediate story which is how is he going to do that? And we see that in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. And it's how God is redeeming and restoring his people. And then there's like this third level of narrative, right? And the third level of narrative are these hundreds of individual little stories that make up the other two levels. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves when we're looking at that third level, whether it's the story of David and Goliath, whether it's the story of Samson and Delilah, whether it's the story of Gideon, whether it's the story of Deborah, whether it's, you know, a hundred other stories in scripture, the question that we have to be asking ourselves is how does that little story fit into uh, the first and second levels of the biblical story. What is that little story? What is the story of Samson taking a donkey's jawbone and killing a bunch of Philistines? What does that tell us about um, God's redemption of his people through the covenant? And then what does it tell us about God's overall story um, and how he is working out his salvation and his bringing his people back to himself? What do those stories tell us? And that's a good mindset for us to have as we read through um, these little stories. All of the scriptures in their entirety bear witness to Jesus and focus us toward his loving lordship. Pastor Doug has mentioned this the last couple times that he's preached and it's been something that is a good reminder for me all the time, particularly as we go through the New Testament, excuse me, the Old Testament in these stories about David. We should always be on the lookout for Jesus in the Old Testament. He's there. He's, he's uh, alluded to, he is foreshadowed so many times in the Old Testament. 
Um, and we have the opportunity as we read through these narratives in the Old Testament to really get some good clues about not only Jesus is coming and our eventual coming in the, in the timeline of the narrative, but also for clues about the nature and character of God. They are revealed throughout the Old Testament. Um, his jealousy, his wrath, his anger, his mercy, his compassion, his redemption, all of those things are there in the Old Testament. We just often don't look for them because we expect it to be in the New Testament. We're like, oh, the Old Testament God, he's just angry all the time and he smites people all the time. But we don't really look for deeper levels of his character um, there in the Old Testament. So that's something really important that we need to be doing. So that we've talked a little bit about what they are uh, narratives are and what their purpose is, here's a few things to remember about what narratives are not. They are not allegories or stories filled with hidden meanings, okay? They are not like, um, when I say allegory, for those of you who have watched um, The Pirates Who Don't Do Anything, a VeggieTales movie, I gotta tell you, it is one of the most beautiful allegories that I've ever seen. Um, also, uh, The Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe, all the Chronicles of Narnia, those are allegorical. Um, there are a lot of allegorical elements in Lord of the Rings, that sort of thing. They are stories that sort of stand in the place of another story that tell the same story, but all of the elements have meanings and they kind of go directly that way. That is not what Old Testament narrative is. It is a story that gives us important information, but it doesn't have hidden meaning that we have to kind of pull out and pluck out and all that kind of stuff. And also, the individual Old Testament narratives are not intended as morality tales. These are not Aesop's fables. They're not, you know, listen to your parents, you're going to get into trouble. They are used and they often illustrate what is taught explicitly and implicitly elsewhere, right? So they are illustration points for other things that Scripture teaches. And we're going to talk about this next week when we talk about the law. The law really teaches the lesson and tells you what you should and shouldn't do. And these stories illustrate what happens when you follow or don't follow the rules set forth in the law. Does that make sense? Hopefully it makes sense. All right, we've talked about what narrative is, what it isn't. So let's talk about some characteristics of narrative. Narrative is really cool because it gives us, um, it's already something we're familiar with. Uh, we watch stories all the time. Sorry, I really need to get a haircut. Um, we watch stories all the time. We see movies on TV. We go to the theater. We watch plays. We are familiar with what stories look like. And so when we look at Old Testament narratives, we already have kind of a good idea of what it's going to look like. Um, so the first characteristic found in biblical narrative is the idea of the narrator. That's someone that we're familiar with in uh, literature, in um, uh, film, TV. You'll sometimes see a narrator, things like that. He's the storyteller, right? He is sort of this omniscient, all-knowing character uh, in, the, in the story, but he often won't share or does not share everything that he knows. He won't comment or explain or evaluate during the unfolding of the narrative. So he's just there to tell the story. He's not going to editorialize on it at all. He is what... Um, just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts, ma'am. He's the, uh, the dragnet character of scripture, right? The narrator, this idea of the narrator. Uh, the narrator is responsible for the point of view of the story. So the perspective from which the story is told, this is the divine perspective. So basically the narrator is above the story, right? He's looking at the parade from like being up in a drone as it were. And he is looking down on the entire parade and he is telling the story from beginning to end from this elevated divine perspective. And that's the really neat thing about the narrator is that we get to see above the immediate. Because my version of a story and your version of a story are going to be very different. It's going to take an independent third party to really tell a different story as to what it is. And that's important for us to remember when we talk about the narrator. There's not any, um, like I said, editorializing or commenting on the story as it is. The thing that's important for us when we think about the narrator is that we have to be on the lookout for how this narrator, who's been inspired by God to tell this story, how does he disclose the point of view from which you are to understand the story? What is it that we, what clues are there in the story that tell us what we need to be understanding about that story? Um, 
so that's one of the things that we have to be on the lookout for as we read through this historical narrative. Uh, some of the characteristics of the narrative are the scene, all right? So we, we are used to that. We have scenes in films and TV, and we really set the stage for the action that's about to take place. Uh, the predominant mode in narration in Hebrew narratives is called scenic narration, all right? The action is moved along by a series of scenes that together make up a whole. Like, again, going back to Guardians of the Galaxy, just like Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm going to do this because my hair is on my face and it's driving me crazy. There, much better. Um, the scenes sort of separately and together make up the narrative work. So you will have a story that'll be told in chunks, that'll be told in scenes. And those scenes together tell the entire story. So when we have, for example, the fall of man, right? There is the scene where they are in the garden, right? Establishing shot. They're in the garden, beautiful garden. They're naked, they're unafraid. Then the serpent comes, right? And the serpent tells Eve, kind of, you know, calls the herd and calls her and says, hey, Eve, here's, you know, scene two. You, what did, what are you supposed to do in the garden? And she's like, oh, we can have anything we want in the garden. And the snake's like, not really. What can't you have? And she's like, oh, well, we're not supposed to eat from that one. Because then we'll be like God. And he's like, did he really say that? And then see and then she's like oh i guess not so she eats the apple she's deceived right cut to the next scene and then she convinces adam who makes the choice there so it's all these scenes that together tell us about the fall of man but they're individual scenes within the whole uh story and the whole work uh so we've got scenes that are really important we've got the narrator we've got the scene now we have the characters all right characters are absolutely the central element of the story obviously the characters, the story is about people, right? Um, it's using people to illustrate the point of what God is trying to accomplish. And so they are absolutely the central element of every story. Uh, characterization has really very little to do with appearance. You won't often see a description of the character in scripture. Um, if it's there, it's important and it's there for a reason. And you really have to ask yourself why. Um, for example, we have no physical description of Adam and Eve other than that they were naked. And it's important to the story because it comes back around later. that They were ashamed of being naked, which they hadn't had shame and experienced shame before. But once sin enters the picture, then they experience shame. So it's really important for us to understand why they are described in that capacity. But other than that, Eve, was she blonde? Was she brunette? Was she hefty? Was she skinny? We have no no understanding of that. Um, we can make guesses and we see it depicted a lot of ways based on our understanding of humanity and all that kind of stuff. Scripture's silent, right? Uh, characters often appear either in contrast or in parallel and are understood in relationship to each other. So we know who the good guys are because we know who the bad guys are, sort of thing. Um, or a lot of times you'll see um, characters that are in parallel to one another and they're moving down the same track. So you've got Cain and Abel, they move down the same track and then one deviates and then we see what happens, right? Uh, characterization often occurs in the character's own words and actions. So we know who they are and we know what their character is based on what they say and do. That's like normal. We know we do that. So again, narrative is seems like a scary word, but it's really not so much of it is just what we're already doing anyways. Uh, the next element of Hebrew narrative is dialogue. Uh, dialogue is a crucial feature of uh, Hebrew narrative, and it is the chief method of characterization. So we know primarily about the people who are in the story based on what they say. Um, the first point of dialogue is often significant. Uh, it's a significant clue both to the story plot and to the character of the speaker. So what is the opening words that are uttered by a particular character going to give you a lot of insight into who that person is. And this is really, again, something that we see in film and TV. You get to learn a lot about the person that you are watching the film about based on what they say at the beginning. Uh, contrastive dialogue often functions as a way of characterizations as well. And so you'll see characters who speak in contrast with one another. And that, again, layers of detail into the story. 
Uh, very often the narrator, again, that divine perspective who sees everything, that will emphasize the crucial parts of the narrative by having one of the characters repeat or summarize the narrative in a speech. And so if there's something that we really need to catch, narrator is going to make that apparent to us. Um, pretend that we're really dumb and just give us all the information again in a very succinct method right there. Uh, so dialogue, obviously, character and dialogue, character plus dialogue plus scene equals plot. Again, something that we are familiar with. Uh, narrative has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Okay. It's usually thrust forward by some kind of conflict. So that's what drives the story forward. And it's generally speaking conflict. Conflict is the instigator of almost all plot. Even now, I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy just saw the second one. It was a great film. I loved it. There's no plot unless there's some kind of conflict. And that one is interesting because the conflict comes a little bit later on in the film than we think it is. There's, there's A plots and B plots and all that kind of stuff. But when we look back at scripture, it usually, the action is quick, right? Uh, it's if, in contrast to like Guardians of the Galaxy, right? Hebrew narrative is very fast. And if it slows down for whatever reason, again, there is, a, there is a reason for it and we have to find out what that is. As opposed to just a slowly paced plot, which we have a lot of times in film now, in Hebrew narrative, you're going to move at a pretty big breakneck speed. There's not time for a lot of exposition in the narrative. They're just going to get into the story and get out of the story. These are really brief tellings of whatever's going on. So if it slows down, ask why. There's something important. There's a detail that you need to see. There's a detail that you need to understand if it slows down like that. All right, so let's talk about the structure of Hebrew narrative. It uses a whole series of structural features to catch the hero's attention and keep him or her fastened on the narrative. And the reason for this is because Hebrew narrative is oral tradition. They were not reading a book. They were listening. And so it had to be kept short and sweet because they were going to retell the story and it had to be something that was easily remembered as they heard it over and over and over again. It's a lot easier to memorize the Pledge of Allegiance than it is to memorize the preamble to the Constitution because one is long and one is short. Well, the preamble's not that long, but you get the idea, right? Um, I, I know Jesus wept is a much easier scripture to memorize than the entirety of Hebrews chapter 11. Yeah? Okay. So some of the features of that structure that we talked about that keep people engaged is repetition. Key words supply emphasis. So if you see a word that's repeated over and over, there's a reason, supply emphasis. Uh, key phrases uh, can resume the narrative after some kind of interruption or detour. So you'll see where it's like, telling the story, telling the story, telling the story, and it'll say, and so-and-so did such and such. And then it'll kind of break away and it'll tell some other part of the story. And then it'll say, and so-and-so did such and such and such and such, right? Brings you back to that point in the story. So we're going from here, there's a little door, and then we're coming back right around to here so that we can tell the rest of the story. It's like, meanwhile, right? Uh, the other uh, important thing to remember is a technique called inclusion. And that's just the technical term for the form of repetition where a narrative is begun and brought to a conclusion on the same note or in the same way. Um, one of my favorite authors, she does this all the time. Um, she will use a key word to end the chapter and then she will pick up using that same word or phrase at the beginning of the next chapter to really bridge the gap. Even if it's completely different scenic uh, a completely different scene or, or a character, all that kind of stuff, it connects the story in that way and it's really important. Um, if you're wondering who that is, it's Liz Curtis Higgs. She's done um, a lot of really great books that I love. Um, side note. Going back to what you're talking about, <laughs> the one thing that's really important is we have to keep in mind the presence of God in the narrative. Uh, he is the ultimate character, the supreme hero of every story. So if we're not seeing God in it, a, we're not looking hard enough, and B, we've missed the point of whatever's happening. Uh, a couple things that we need to keep our eyes on. Reading between the lines. There's implicit teaching. What does that mean? It's something that's not clearly stated in the story, um, but is totally and obviously there. For example, God is not mentioned once in the book of Esther, 
keys throughout the entire thing, but he's never mentioned. So that's implicit. Uh, the other thing is explicit, and that's like clearly stated in the text, right? Implicit, the important thing to remember about implicit is that it's not secret. It's not hidden. It's not... Um, in incapable of being understood, it doesn't require any kind of special dispensation from God to know that it's there. Um, it just means that a dimension of the message is capable, excuse me, of being understood from what is said, even if it's not stated. Um, if you are not able to confidently express to something, uh, to someone else, something taught implicitly so that they can understand it as well, you're probably misreading the text. If it requires some kind of special dispensation from God in order to be able to like tell people what's going on, no, wrong, try again. Uh, here's the thing that we have to make sure that we're not doing when we talk about Hebrew narrative. Remember, it's not all about you, not all about me. Allegorizing is this idea that we are relegating the text to merely reflecting another meaning beyond the text. That Remember, we talked about Hebrew narrative is not allegory. Uh, the next thing is decontextualizing, and that's taking a story and yanking it out of the out of the context of scripture. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Context was important. Um, we're ignoring the full historical or literary context of a particular story, and we're missing interpretational clues because we are just going to yank it out and say, "Oh, well, this means this." But when you look at it in the whole, it totally doesn't. Right? Uh, selectivity. Cherry picking specific words or specific phrases to concentrate on while ignoring the entirety of the narrative, the overall sweep of the narrative. We can really easily pull out little tiny words and go, well, this is the meaning of the entire thing. And then when you read the story as a whole, you're like, no, I don't think so. And that's something that's really easy to do. These three things, we can do that in all of scripture, not just the narrative, but I think it's particularly easy to do when we talk about narrative. Uh, the next is moralizing. And that's the assumption that principles for living can be derived from every passage. Not every story is going to give us a principle for how we're supposed to live our lives. It's easy for us to assume that, but sometimes a narrative is simply giving us facts. And it might be giving us facts that we need to contextualize another passage. Or it might just be telling a story because it's building in characterization. There's not necessarily, often there is, but not necessarily some kind of moral of the story, right? Personalizing. And that is supposing that any or all parts of a narrative apply to you in a way that they do not apply to everyone else. The word of the Lord doesn't say something special for Jessica that it doesn't say for everybody else, right? Same for you guys. The word of the Lord doesn't say something for you that is not totally applicable to everybody else. Um, again, not how it works. Finally, misappropriation. Assuming to have... Assuming a narrative to have a purpose that is foreign to why it's really there. So I think the, the most common or the, the easiest one to understand is you've probably heard the term Gideon's Fleece. Um, we read Gideon's Fleece and it's the story of this guy Gideon who the Lord has told to do something. And Gideon's like, well, if it's really you, then today I want you to, I'm going to put this fleece out overnight and I want the ground around the fleece to be dewy and damp, but I want the fleece to be dry. Uh, if this is really what you want. So the next morning, sure enough, ground is wet, fleece is dry. And then Gideon's like, ah, I'm still not sure, right? So I'm going to put the fleece out again. This time I want the fleece to be wet. I want the ground to be dry. And, uh, got, and next morning, sure enough, fleece is wet, ground is dry. We tend to use that story a lot of times by saying, oh, well, I'm just going to put out this fleece and see what the Lord says. Really, the story is about Gideon not hearing the voice of the Lord and not wanting to do what God said and trying to make it so that he didn't have to do what God said because he was a coward. So, well, he was, well, yeah, he wanted to be cowardly and then God like kicks him in the pants and he becomes this great warrior. Again, remembering that it's not all about us. When we talk about that, we have to make sure that we're actually accurately looking at the scripture and not giving it some different meaning that's not really intended by the narrative. Okay, False appropriation is the idea that we're reading into a biblical narrative contemporary ideas that are foreign to the narrator's purpose and contrary to his point of view. So step out of your modern mindset for a minute when you read the Old Testament because we have very different connotations about phrases. We have very different ideas of the world and you have to put on an Old Testament hat to read Old Testament stories. You can't, you can't use 2017 as a guide. 
False combination is combining elements that are unrelated to make a point that is uh, not intended. So again, don't just cherry pick parts of the story and be like, well, this and this means this. When you look at the overall point of the story and that's not what it means. Uh, finally, uh, another, the last caution is uh, the idea of redefinition. When the, me when the plain meaning of a text leaves people spiritually cold, a lot of times they're often tempted to redefine it into something else. If there's not some huge earth shattering, oh, the Lord is telling me this, then the tendency is to be like, well, actually it means this and the Lord is telling me this and it's going to change your life and it's going to be amazing. Not how it works. Sometimes it's kind of like, okay, all right, duly noted. Carry on. Um, here's a couple principles just real quickly. An Old Testament narrative usually does not directly teach a doctrine. It usually illustrates a doctrine or doctrines taught um, propositionally up somewhere else in Scripture. So it's not going to teach the doctrine, but it's going to illustrate a doctrine found somewhere else. Narratives record what actually happened, not what should have happened or what ought to happen every time. So again, not every narrative has an individual identifiable moral application. It's just telling the story of what occurred. Um, what people do in narratives is not necessarily a good example of us frequently. It's the opposite. A lot of times in the Old Testament, it's this is what you shouldn't do, not what you should do, right? Many, and if not most of the characters in the Old Testament narratives are far from perfect and as their actions totally indicate that. So again, we've been talking about David a lot. If you are looking at the life of David, do not copy everything the man does. He got it wrong so much, right? We are trying to learn from his mistakes as well as the things that he did that were correct. So don't copy the life of David, please, for the love. Copy certain elements of David. Don't do all of David. Number six, we are not always told at the end of a narrative whether what happened was good or bad. Again, they're not passing judgment or commentary on any of this. We are expected to be able to judge this on the basis of what God has taught us directly and categorically elsewhere in Scripture, okay? So you have to be able to interpret what the, what the purpose of the story is. All narratives are selective and incomplete. Not every relevant detail is given. For example, I would love to know some details about Ruth and Naomi that are just not listed there. Like, what did they talk about during the four days that they were traveling from Moab to Bethlehem? I want to know these things. What kind of conversations were they having? Scripture is silent. I don't need to know. It's not important to the narrative of the story. Um... Narratives are not written to answer all of our theological questions. They have particular, specific, and limited purposes and deal with certain issues, leaving others to be dealt with elsewhere in other ways. It's not going to answer or address every theological question that you have. Finally, narratives may teach others either explicitly by clearly stating something or implicitly by clearly implying something without actually saying it. Um, and remember, overall, God is the hero of all biblical narratives. And so what's important for us to remember is that he's the guy that this is ultimately pointing to. And so when we read through the Old Testament and we read through these individual stories, we really have to ask ourselves, what is it that God is revealing about himself through that story? Um, he's the hidden character in everything. So we might be reading a story about David and Goliath, but we are really getting an understanding of the nature and character of God through that story. Uh, we might be reading the story of um, Daniel in the lion's den. What is God telling us about himself through Daniel in the lion's den? So these are important things for us to remember as we look through the Old Testament narrative. Again, I am so sorry that the video did not work properly the way that it was supposed to. I will upload, um, I will try to upload some uh, the PowerPoints for this so that you have the points, um, so that we can, you know, <laughs> you look through it and you can take notes and you can have those. Again, I do recommend that you go out and get yourself a copy of this book. They have it on Kindle on Amazon. So if you don't want the physical copy, although I will tell you this, my copy of this book is highlighted 
um, like crazy because it has a lot of good information in it. But this again is How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. Sorry, it's backwards. Um, you can get it on Amazon. If you go through Smile Amazon, you can uh, support Valley. That would be awesome. Uh, it's a great book and lots of really good information in it. Covers a lot. You can tell it's a big, thick book, but hopefully we're going to chop it up in a lot of ways so that it makes it easier to understand. Next week, we're going to be talking about the law and how we read the sections of scripture that deal with the Old Testament law and what that means for us and what we have to look at in that. And um, I know that one can be tough. There's like 618 laws that we see in uh, the Old Testament and something like that. I think I have that number correct. Um, sorry, it's been a long day and there is not enough coffee in the world for me today. <laughs> <laughs> so if I have the number wrong, forgive me. But um, it's important for us to understand what that looks like uh, when we read through the law. A lot of times we're tempted to just skip over it because it's boring. Uh, we skip through those. We skip through the so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-sos because we think they're boring. Um, and they can be. They can be a little dry. Uh, but again, like we've talked about with these narratives, they do serve an important purpose, something that we need to take a look at and understand if we're going to read through the entirety of Scripture. Huh. Something that we need to understand if we're going to read through the entirety of Scripture when it comes to um, uh, the law, what that implies, not just for the narrative of the stories that we've been reading, but what it implies for us now, what we should be taking from it, and how it sets the stage for Jesus. Again, Everything in the Old Testament is about setting the stage for Jesus. So thank you so much for joining uh, me on today's, oh, sorry, <laughs> joining me on today's study. And hopefully we'll get these technical difficulties worked out next time so that we won't have any more of these uh, annoying glitches. I don't know what it is. The settings were the same from week to week. <sighs> Technology. I love it. And it treats me this way. I don't understand. Have a great rest of your day, guys. God bless you. And we'll see you next week. Bye.